Chapter 5 I stood for a moment on the Candlewick corner, scratching myself thoroughly, and headed for the west. The air smelled of cooking, and the street smelled of dog. If you want to be specific, of a six o'clock spaniel and a seven-thirty pug, and they wouldn't get walked again till ten or eleven or so, so I didn't have to worry. I paced myself carefully and turned, looking around. It was one of those blocks full of nothing in particular, mom-and-pop storefronts with three-, four-, and five-story tenements above. Most of the windows hid wherever they were hiding under thick, dusty draperies and drawn Venetian blinds. Most of the stores had been shuttered for the night, padlocked with hard metal gates across the front, and the wind howled against them like a disappointed thief. A voice up above me said, Watch it there, Sonny. One more step and you'll be in it to your neck. I turned and looked up. Go for three windows over and you'll have it, said the voice. It belonged, I discovered, to an elderly calico with sharp, beady eyes. She was sitting on the sill of a second-story window next to several parched-looking pots of philodendron and a red plastic falcon with a rope around his neck. Beg pardon, ma'am, I said. Gum, she said. Big, fat, purple wad of gum. You're going to step right into it and stick yourself to death. I could see it, ma'am. I looked at the bubble gum and nodded. Nothing funny there, Sonny. It's a crime and a danger, and there ought to be a law. A law? I said. You listen to the radio, Sonny. 720 on the dial. They discuss it all the time. What we need in this study, son, is gum control. Now. She nodded. People have to wait a week to buy their gum. They wouldn't spit it all over us. They'd put it in a jar. That's what I think she offered me. There ought to be a law. I smiled and said, Yes, ma'am, I think I see your point. In fact, I could see almost everything about her. There's somebody like her on almost every block, one of those nosy ones with nothing much to do except lean on the window sill and snoop around the street. And the one thing I desperately needed was a snoop. I smiled and said, Tell me, did you happen to be sitting on the sill this afternoon? Around five, for example. It's possible, she said. I might have just happened to be sitting on the sill. Why? She looked off at me with bright, fertile eyes. Is there something I should know? If you did know, I said, I'd appreciate it, ma'am. I mean, the thing is, I'm actually looking for a buddy and I wondered if you'd noticed him. Sandy-haired fellow? Kind of slanted green eyes? You mean the crazy cat, she said. Young maniac, running up and down there like a fool. You mean the crazy cat, she said. Young maniac, running up and down here like a fool. I was telling it to Roger. She squinted at the falcon. Not that he'd notice it. You talk yourself blue to him. He doesn't say a thing. I tried to resist. You think the cat's got his tongue? I didn't hear you there, Sonny. I said, I said loudly, did you see where he was going? Roger here. She batted him. Hasn't moved an inch. No, sir, his flying days is over for a while. Used to be you batted him, he'd rock it to the sidewalk. But the other fellow lives here. He tied him with a rope. So now he just sits here and sulks his little sulk. I meant the other one, I offered. The sandy one. Oh, him, she said. He travels to the church around the corner. The church, I said. Visits there a thousand times a day. She nodded. Got it figured he'd be one nasty sinner. I was you, son. I'd stay away from that type. And I will, ma'am, I promised. Just as soon as I can find him. Thanks a lot, ma'am. I waved at her and headed up the street. Mind the gum, she called after me, and watch out for low-flying pigeons from the roof. The sign in the corner said, All welcome, church. Whatever your religion is, we welcome you with love. Open seven days, all night, all year. The church was a small and very cozy-looking place, a brown stone building with an open red floor. 
I looked at it and figured I'd been wrong about Sandy. Clearly, he wasn't chasing women after all. He was chasing serenity, a place on the planet that welcomed all creatures into one big family and welcomed them with love. I padded through the door. Inside, I found a nice, warm, carpet-covered floor with a couple of benches and a dark wooden table with a coffee pot and buns. Beyond it, again with its double doors open, was a much bigger area with benches in a row, and from deep in their shadows came a soft, muted sob. I moved in quietly and looked around the room. To the eye, it seemed empty. To the ear, it seemed to hold all the sorrow in the world. I followed the sobbing to the benches on the left and walked slowly up the aisle, and there she was, snuggled in the corner of the seventeenth bench, with her paws across her eyes, was a small, plain tabby cat, black and gray striped, the kind of color that my good friend Sue, when she's being catty, is inclined to call mousy. Her sobs really tore me. They were heartbreaking, sad, and yet infinitely sweet. I stopped and said, Miss? At first she didn't hear me, so I jumped up next to her and whispered it again. Miss? She looked up. Her eyes were as lovely as an Arizona sky, just as wide and as blue and as promising as that. They were the eyes that gave you images of long, happy summer times and soft velvet easy chairs and calm, fishy seas. Can I offer you some help? She shook her head despairingly. No one can help me. It's my husband, she said. About three whole hours ago I sent him to the deli, and it's only on the corner, but he never came back. She sobbed again. He never came back. Maria, she's my friend. She said he simply ran away. She said he never really loved me, but... Oh, oh. she looked up at me. I know that isn't true. No, it, it couldn't be, I said, nearly drowning in her eyes. But something funny is going on. I mean, I'm looking for a friend of mine who's also disappeared. So maybe I could look for your husband while I'm... Oh, she said, could you? Could you please? She sat up straighter now and very nearly smiled. I'll describe him. Go ahead. She smiled. He's the nicest-looking cat that ever lived. Oh, I know you won't believe me. Just plain old Rosie getting such a handsome boy. But anyway, he's sandy-haired and green-eyed and... Sandy? She nodded. That's his name. And I'm his friend. My name's Sam. The detective? Oh, he's talked about you, Sam. He really has. And we'd have asked you to the wedding, but the thing is... She whispered it. We had to keep it secret. I bet, I said. Even his sister doesn't know. It's his manager he's scared of. He thought she'd disapprove because I don't have a pedigree. Anyway, we married August 7th, right here, in this very pretty church. Gabriel did the ceremony just like the minister. Maria was the bridesmaid, and we, Doc, and Doris made a perfect little choir. It was all so beautiful. Sandy... Sandy said he'd cherish me till till death. She broke down again. Don't even think it, Rosie. Please. And, and, and don't cry. Just tell me what you know. You said you sent him to the store? For a pickle, Rosie said. I, I've got a craving for a pickle. You see? She looked it up at me. We're having some little ones. Maria says we're having little triplets. All boys? And Sandy keeps asking me what he can do for me, and, well, I had a sudden weird craving for a pickle. That's the last time you saw him? She nodded. He was heading for the deli up the block. Oh, please, Sam, she sniffed at me. Please, please find him. He's the dearest, sweetest, the kindest thing I know. I looked at those eyes again, deep as a wishing well and beautiful with love. This was getting pretty mushy, so I had to look away. 
I'm going to try to, I promised, and cocked my head and grinned. Is there anything else I can bring you from the deli? One husband? One pickle? Can you think of something else? Well, she said reflectively, as long as you're going, I wouldn't mind a little chopped liver on the side. <laughs>